let it cry deeper for those in sin who have no Savior or Lord. May my heart throb with the pain that you feel, when no intercession is made, to call a dying world back to you so those who are lost can be saved. The filth, the decay of those who have need brings sorrow and tears to their eyes. But oh, what sorrow you must feel when sin has so blinded our eyes. I walk down the street to see weary souls struggle to make it another day. Life is so hard they want to give up. Does God want people to live this way? No, cries my heart. What can I do to help a weary soul today? I'll listen. I'll cry. I'll share what I can. But most of all, Lord, I must pray. I think that's the heartbeat of God. That whatever we do, we have to first understand that He wants people to come to know Him. Because He's the solution. I think that I can speak from a very personal standpoint because I grew up in poverty myself in Virginia near Appalachia. So if you've seen some of the little white kids from Appalachia, you probably have seen me in one way or another. Life is very difficult. And I can remember the struggles that I had growing up in poverty, feeling like a nobody. Kathy Meek says it very, very clearly and beautifully when she says, I want somebody to know my name. As I was growing up, that's what my desire was, that somehow I would feel that my life had significance and that someone would know my name. I can remember the frustrations of growing up in poverty because instead of being affirmed by a world that sees power and prestige and wealth as a standard, instead I was looked down upon and denied those very, very basic things that help us to feel that self. When I started school, my dad was a, a sharecropper, farmer, illiterate, and my mother could barely read and write. And so we didn't learn a whole lot between the ages of birth and six years old. And when I started school, it was very, very difficult because I had a very mean first grade teacher. And that teacher, I can remember we would walk into the classroom and would sit down and she'd say, now hold your hand out. And we'd have to hold her hand out and she would check to see if they were dirty. And if they were dirty, she would take a ruler and she'd make us turn her hand over and she'd slap with the ruler. And so I began to think that somehow God was punishing me for being poor and not having running water and having to walk so far to get it. And, and more and more my self-esteem began to deteriorate my self -esteem. It wasn't until many, many years later that I would find that self-worth in Jesus. And he's the one that wants to give us all self-worth. And that's why we as the church, as we go into the inner city, we have to see people the way Jesus sees them. Beyond the poverty, beyond the snotty noses, beyond the, the dirt. And instead of slapping them on the hand, we've got to embrace them and say, Jesus cares about you. And he's going to show you that, the fact that I'm going to love you. If you've ever heard the song in the 1960s called Down in the Boondocks, you've heard my story. Because it goes like this, if you haven't heard it. It says, down in the boondocks, down in the boondocks, people put me down because that's the side of town I was born in. You know, I was, I was at the donut shop this morning, and I happened to mention Lawndale, and all the eyes went up. What are you doing in Lawndale? And I began to have the flood, once again, of those memories of somehow being born on the wrong side of town, not really having the resources that made me somebody. And so I began to tell them all the wonderful things that God was doing in Lawndale and how God was in Lawndale. And it was exciting. And people began to listen because Jesus was here. People put me down because that was the side of town I was born in. And I decided at a very young age that one fine day I was going to find a way to move 
to accomplish that dream. I married a man, even as the song says, that lived on the other side of the tracks. His father was a judge and a lawyer. Wealth was in the family. And it wasn't long until we had wealth. Four bedroom house, three, uh, two car garage, circular drive, three bedroom, and uh, three baths, six fancy luxury vans, and I guess the world said I was somebody. But the Lord said, now go back to the Unfortunately, just like the song said, I didn't want to look back. But I couldn't get away from the conviction and from the burden. Every time I'd open up the Word of God, the Lord would once again remind me of his heart wrong to minister to the needs of the poor. One of the scriptures is plain in the scripture that you read. I would lay down at night and it was like a video going through my head. And I would see every, I would experience all over again the agony and the pain and the rejection and the frustration of growing up poor. So many circumstances and many events finally led me to the poor. I found out where they were. Oh, I had never totally left because we would take bums and prostitutes and they'd come and live in our big fancy house and all the neighbors hated us because we were reaching out to the poor. But the Lord wanted more. He wanted us to go and live among the poor. He wanted us to go and to let him live through us among the poor. And that was very difficult. Now I look back seven years later, actually eight years later, because we took the first year to prepare and that led us to Boise of Calvary. Praise God for the study center there. And that's one reason why I'm grateful to be able to share on this, this task force for the study center, because I know the importance of it. Thank God that someone had a vision that other people would need to learn and need to, need to know how to start community development works. I thank God for Dolphus Weary. I don't know if he's here yet or not, but he'll be here tomorrow at least. Because he not only said... I'll walk beside you. But he did it. He not only said it, he did it. And for seven years, no, for seven years, he's held my hand. And he said, Kathy, this is the way to walk. This is what the Lord is doing. And I'm grateful. After seven years, I can look back and I can see the Lord beginning to pull my heart, the heart tug of, of working with youth. After I came back from DOC, I had to say, Lord, now, how do you take all of these years, 20 years of work and labor and sweat and prayer and start that in Dallas, Texas? And the Lord began to burden my heart for the kids. And he put an idea there. He put an idea in my mind that said, if you can start with the kids and if you can win the trust of the kids and you can win the trust of the community, there's nothing that I can't do. And I can raise up leaders for West Dallas. I can raise up leaders in these kids that will want to do something in their community. So Boys Adult Ministries now has a lot of adult ministry. We have a dental clinic that's run by volunteer dentists and dental hygienists. We have financial services. We have a health club, which is utilizing Christian music as well as Dr. Cooper's protocols from the aerobic center. We have job training and skills training for our kids. We have Bible classes, discipleship classes. We have sports. But do you know that every single thing that we have done in the adult community, whether it's senior citizens to shut in to a health club, has been to accomplish one goal. We want to see these kids that we started with when they were 5 to 12, that are now being 13 to 18, become Christian leaders in West Valley. And that's what it's all about, reproducing ourselves. That's what this conference is all about, is that we can learn from each other and get better at that. And that we can really take the call that God has on the church as a whole and say, we are alive and well, girl. We're here. And we're ready to let God know. Because he really is our source anyway. As I was praying about this conference, the Lord gave me another poem. I, I like poetry because sometimes it says something so much better than we can say in prose. And this, I want to say to you, is a, a word of encouragement, but also, for many of you, a challenge. It was to me seven years ago. It's called The Witness. 
you willing to come and share in my pain? Are you willing to live among poverty and shame? Are you willing to cry and walk by my side? Then don't say Jesus loves me. Will you hope and look for a way to ease life's burden in my life today? If your answer is yes, then maybe I'll see there really is a God. Eventually, the fellowship grew. 
out of that was born Russell Kelly Fellowship Church. I began attending the church and singing in the church choir with some of my friends from home. But it was not until 1979 that I gave Jesus my life. Slowly I began to understand why John and Bill made perfect and involved in my life. I began to see how God's hand was moving in my life. I started going to serve him in all areas of my life, including my child. I was working for the YMCA in 1984 when I became interested in working for a Christian ministry. I applied at Foster Academy Ministries to be a part of their crew of the housing ministry. It's known as People's Development, PDA for short, housing and construction on Foster Academy Ministries. <clears throat> you know, God has a great sense of humor. Sometimes I feel like he puts twists and turns and surprises into our lives just to give us a joke. <laughs> he wants us to know that he's in control. <laughs> when they finally got in touch with me to tell me I had gotten a job, it was to my surprise that they were hiring me as director of housing. <laughs> you know, I was excited, really excited about that. But I was quite challenged. I'd never been the bottom line person before. Being a manager didn't come easy for me either. But I know now that God was putting me in a place so that I could grow and develop as a leader. Sometimes it's hard being a leader, but I realize that God will never put more on me than I can handle. The second aspect of Christian community development that I want to share with you about tonight is very, very close to my heart. God has given me a burden for housing for the poor, providing low-cost housing for the poor. The 1980 census stated in Jackson, that there were some 11,000 people living in substandard conditions. That fact really challenged me. I began to dream about how I could be involved. I began to dream about how Boston of Cameron Ministries could begin to meet some of those needs. I began sharing some ideas with friends, talking with Liam. You know when you have a lot of you just dream. So I mean, you just want to just do something so bad, you just try to dream up and all those kind of things. Because God's working on us. Throughout the he'll do those kind of things to you. It was while traveling right here in Chicago with Liam that a friend of ours gave us a gift that helped us to purchase 14 homes back in one of the poorest areas in Jackson, Mississippi. <coughs> Thus, Boston Cabin Ministries Adopted House Program was born. Since then, we purchased two more and have changed dilapidated duplex shotgun homes to single families, homes for eight families. There's much more work to be done, and more houses to build. But the change is already apparent in the community. I have a dream about the community. The dream is to transform the entire neighborhood. The changing from a typical southern ghetto of renters to a neighborhood of homeowners. As I look back over my life, I'm thankful to God for the way he used the Perkins and so many others like Lim Tucker to be examples of Christian leaders. I believe in the vision of Christian community development. Had it not been for someone who believed in us, who came to our community, and lived with us, I could not stand before you tonight. In March of 89, Lim Tucker, my good friend, President of Boston Cabin Ministries, was struck with a rare form of cancer. During his illness, he appointed me as interim executive director. June of this year, I'm dead. Now I'm facing one of the hardest challenges of my life. This past September, the VOSM Board of Servants, they gave me the responsibility of executive director. You know, I still take comfort in the knowledge that God will not put more me than I can handle. And he's given me a good support staff that I'm thankful for. They're encouraging me and they're helping me in this task. You know what I pray about the most? That God will continue to use all of us, whether here in Chicago, Jackson, Mississippi, or around the country. That those of us in those communities demonstrate God's love to the many people of this world. Hopefully through those of us who are living out this vision of Christian community development, other little boys just like I was, will have an opportunity to become leaders so that they can be able to give something back to the community. This is 
my challenge to you tonight. That if you ever get discouraged and you begin to wonder whether or not Christian community development really works, just think about me. <laughs> <laughs> think about all those other thousands of boys and girls out there who need a chance to black men. The same kind of chance that God gave me through the Perkins, through Lynn Tucker, through Boston County Ministries. Thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Lord, we thank you for Lamb's life. Lord, that he was truly a fulfillment of what Jesus said. That no man put his hand to the cloud and look back. Lamb left seminary. John was a character. so much to and be served. And now we come tonight to thank you for Mel to celebrate this life that you have saved, you've rescued, and you've led and you've brought to this place. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray your special blessing upon him, upon his wife, upon his family, 
kids because they can live with a, a father and mother who's going to care for them, who's going to challenge them, who's going to help them to, to develop so they can give themselves fully to their people and to all people. So Lord, we thank you for that. Now we pray this special blessing upon all of us here. Continue to give us a good time this evening. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Yeah. 